the key to understanding that is to understand that it was never, it's a money, a form of money, but it was never a monetary project. It was always a political project. And once you understand the political dynamics behind it, you can see that it's not going to break up. So getting back to the BRICS, what they need is to expand the membership. And by the way, that's exactly what they did on August 22nd. So I said August 22nd, the, the leaders summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, and um, you know, President Xi, President Modi, uh, Prime, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Modi, President Ramaphosa, President Lula, Brazil were all there. Putin would have been there, but there was an arrest warrant for his arrest under, from the International Criminal Court. So Putin didn't go. He's like, it's a distraction. And I said, this would be a landmark or turning point in the development of the BRICS currency. And unfortunately for me, I actually have to read this stuff. And there's a 24 page single space final communique from the BRICS Johannesburg summit. And I read the whole thing. It barely mentions the new currency, just in passing in one section, a kind of oblique, but barely mentions the new currency. And everyone said, uh, Hey, Jim, you said this was going to be a landmark in the development of the new, new currency. What happened? Well, the answer is it was. They did the thing they needed to do. It wasn't issuing a currency that was going to be it was going to fail if you only had five members. They expanded the membership. They're now the BRICS 11. They added Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, uh, Egypt, um, and a couple other countries. So now they went from five to 11, but they've got a waiting list of like 20. Other countries waiting to apply, Algeria, Argentina, Malaysia, et cetera, et cetera. Now, who did they add? Well, when you put Russia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Iran, and Brazil, in the same group, who needs OPEC? Jim Rickard sheds light on a strategic shift in the global economic landscape, emphasizing the growing influence of BRICS nations. With Russia, the second largest oil producer globally, now part of BRICS, the consortium's combined oil output surpasses that of OPEC. The prospect of an expanded BRICS currency gains significance, offering member countries the ability to conduct trade in their own currency. The example of Russia selling oil to India and receiving payment in the BRICS currency highlights the potential for diversified trade beyond conventional norms. And then Jim Rickards envisions a broader membership, possibly reaching around 20 nations, enhancing the viability of the new currency. This approach echoes statements from figures like Lavrov, who previously hinted at the currency's establishment, although not explicitly gold-backed in a traditional sense. Jim Rickards underscores the geopolitical implications of this economic realignment, as BRICS nations position themselves for increased autonomy and collaboration, challenging established economic norms. You've got more oil output in those five countries than you do in OPEC, because um, Russia is not a member of OPEC, and it's the second largest oil producer in the world. So OPEC is now inside the BRICS, or the, the OPEC power to set oil prices is now inside the BRICS. But more importantly, now that you're up to 11, and again, they're on their way to 20, given another year or whatever. So now you launch your BRICS currency and you're Russia and you sell oil to India. Instead of getting paid in rupees, you get paid in the BRICS currency. The difference is instead of having to buy, you know, whatever rice from India, you can go shopping. You can go to Brazil and buy Embraer aircraft. You can go to China and buy semiconductors. You can go to Iran and buy drones. Um, you know, set, you can go to Argentina and buy... Um, uh, you know, they have a lot of natural resources, etc. So, and so can everybody else. China gets paid in the BRICS currency. They can buy oil from Saudi Arabia, the, the oil from Russia, you know, etc. Et or Embraer from Brazil. They're, they're very good aircraft. So the point being, when you expand the membership, you make the not just the likelihood, but the feasibility of the new currency much, much greater. And so give them one more round. They'll invite in another six or seven members next year. They'll get up to around um, 20, close to 20, which is about how many members you have in um, the European Monetary Zone, uh, and then launch the currency uh, to great success. So, so that's, that's how it's playing out. The gold link, and this is what Lavrov said um, about six months ago, he never said it would be gold backed in the sense that if you had some bricks, you could march down to the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of Russia and say, give me the gold. He never said that. And, you know, again, Jim Rickards delves into the intricacies of a potential new global currency and its ties to gold, drawing inspiration from John Maynard Keynes's proposals in 1944. However, Jim emphasizes that while some critics may nitpick the distinction between being gold backed and gold linked, the crucial point is determining the value of the currency in relation to gold. 
Using the hypothetical term brick for the currency, the argument underscores the uniqueness of this system, where one unit equals a specific weight of gold. The key insight lies in the currency's fixed value in terms of gold, employing the transitive law. This approach essentially places the burden on the US dollar to reflect the fluctuations in the global gold market. The genius, as pointed out, is that the issuing nation's BRICS can navigate this new monetary landscape without direct involvement in gold transactions. The prospect of a currency's value being pegged to gold adds an intriguing layer to global economic dynamics, with potential long-term consequences for the US dollar. You know, again, I, I don't want to mention names, but, you know, the usual suspects get all spun up over this and they're on all these programs. He never said that. What he said was that it was not gold backed, but gold linked. And what he meant by that, and he, he was specific. He said, because you have to ask, so what's the value of a brick, one brick? You know, I call it a brick. I don't know what they're going to call it. You know, maybe the bank were not there, John Maynard Keynes. By the way, everything I'm talking about is what Keynes proposed at Britain was in 1944. It was all shut down by the United States by Harry Dexter White, who was a Stalinist agent. But, um, uh, this is a, basically the the uh, return of is the ghost of John Maynard Keynes because what the Russians are doing it's exactly what Keynes wanted to do. He wanted a world currency, not a U.S. dollar. But what Lavrov said is that okay, we're going to define the value of one. I'll call it a brick. I don't again. One brick is going to equal weight of gold. And he didn't say what the weight is. I use it. I say one brick equals one ounce. That's just for illustration purposes. It doesn't matter. You can call it a bank or you can say it's a kilo. It doesn't matter. All of a sudden you have a currency that is uh, the value of which is determined not by reference to another currency, but by reference to gold. Now you say, well, okay, but uh, what does that mean out in the real world? Well, there's a dollar market in gold. The global market in gold is dollar denominated. You can buy it in other currencies, you know, in a store or something like that, but it's pretty much a dollar market. So now we're back to Aristotle, who created syllogisms and logic, father of logic and the transit of law. So if one brick equals one ounce, again, just for illustration, and one ounce equals a certain number of dollars, today it's, you know, 1950, you know, up and down, whatever. Then with the transit of law, you can say, well, one brick equals $1,900. But here's the key. It's not a fixed exchange rate. As the dollar price of gold fluctuates, the value of a brick as a weight of gold will not fluctuate. It's fixed as a weight of gold. But using the transit of law, the dollar value will fluctuate. But it puts it means the U.S. has to do all the dirt, all the dirty work. In other words, the, this is the genius of the Russians. They can just free ride on the dollar gold market. They don't have to intervene. They don't have to buy gold. They don't have to sell gold. They don't even have to have gold. You just say this is what it's worth and then let the dollar do all the dirty work uh, with one footnote, which is if you're the issuer of bricks or the holder of bricks and it's worth a weight of gold, uh, what do you want to happen to the price of gold? Well, you want it to go to the moon because you, you're destroying the dollar through the transit of law and through the dollar denominated gold market. That's that's for the, the long run.